As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people, the people brought to Jesus all who were ill and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak, because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place, where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. And our next passage is from Matthew 6, verses 1 to 4. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honoured by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your right, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. This is the word of God. Good morning, everyone. As Stephen said, my name is Daniel. Great to see you all here this morning. And uh, welcome, especially if you're new to the church, if you're new to Christianity, full stop. Really welcome. Um, Shall we start with a prayer? Uh, Heavenly Father, would you speak to us by your word, through your Holy Spirit, and speak deep into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start with a question for you all. Uh, who here knows a man called Michael Collins? Photo up here, this guy. Michael Collins. Uh, this guy. Anyone know him? Any Michael Collins fans here? He, he's really famous. or should be really famous. Uh, it, you'll definitely know his two crewmates, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Next photo. Here we go. Um, Michael Collins was the third man on the Apollo 11 ship. He's the guy who flew the command module around in orbit on the moon while Neil and Buzz went down to become the first people to walk on the moon and get immortalized in culture. Buzz is in Toy Story. Neil is pretty much a world historic figure now. He's played by Ryan Gosling in that film recently, a first man, great movie. Meanwhile, Michael Collins is pretty much forgotten in our cultural memory, completely unrecognized for what he did. And the question I have for you is, how does that make you feel inside? What's going on inside when you hear that kind of story? Because for me, there's the sense that he's been robbed of something, some kind of significance, some kind of recognition, and that somehow he deserves more from what he did. Now, depending on the way you and I respond to these kinds of stories reveals something quite profound about our own hearts. And so if you're the kind of person who feels this sense of almost discontent with that kind of story, this talk might be for you. So we've been in a series um, on Jesus, and particularly on how in his life he holds together two poles of a contrast that often our culture would separate apart. And today I want to talk to you about uh, significance and hiddenness, or rather the problem of significance and hiddenness. And in some ways, for me personally, this is one of the most important aspects of the Christian life, of how we orient ourselves towards God and towards our communities. Let's get going. There was a um, German philosopher called Heidegger, and he has this profound way of talking about what it means to be a human on planet Earth, and he has this concept called thrownness, that we are thrown into uh, a time and a place that we had no hand in choosing. We are thrown into a family, into a culture, into a context and a class that we had no hand in choosing, and yet somehow we have to make our way through it and make something meaningful out of our lives to build something. And we don't know what that something is, but what we do kind of intuit in our hearts is that our life matters in some 
way, that we are here for something, to be something, to, to become something, to, to, to make something meaningful of our lives, to, to have some kind of significance and purpose and value. Do you feel that? Nods? Yes, nods. Fantastic. And the question is, why? It's a deep, mysterious intuition of the human heart. It's naturally, there's not a very good secular um, reason for, for how, how, we, how we can account for this, yet most spiritual traditions in all of history has recognized this deep intuition for purpose and significance, and the Bible gives beautiful expression to this as well. So in Ecclesiastes 3.11 we read that God has put eternity in the hearts of humanity. Or in Psalm 139, we have that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. There's an intentionality to the way that you are formed as an individual. And of course, on page one of the Bible, we have that you are made in the image of God, the Imago Dei. And this is the truest thing about you, that humans stand out in creation with divine responsibility, with a freedom and with a dignity that is infinite and profound and significant and deep. That's so true. But the other thing that's also true that we experience is the fact that uh, we, we, we've forgotten this intrinsic divine gift, the significance. And so what happens then is we, we start to live in this state of brokenness with God, with each other, and with ourselves. That means that we kind of live in this state of instability and insecurity. And so what happens is that we, we start to want to earn and to take significance and recognition and, and some kind of fame for ourselves. And by the way, this is one of the, uh, one of the ways to read the apple in the Garden of Eden, to, to take something that's meant to be a gift from God. And so we look for human validation, uh, to a desire to be recognized, to be significant, to, to kind of be seen as something more than in the eyes of people around us, as opposed to the eyes of God. Um, and in kind of the Christian tradition, um, this is often in kind of archaic language, uh, the sin of vain glory. It's a pretty cool word, to, to seek glory in vain, vain glory. And, and the way this manifests in our lives can be all sorts of different aspects of our life. And so the extreme example is some of these um, world historic emperor figures. Uh, you have Alexander the Great who talks about how he would rather live a short life of blazing glory than a long life of hiddenness and obscurity. So you have these megalomanic, narcissistic, self-delusional people who want to conquer the world and become emperor of the universe. I mean, I, I doubt there's anyone in here who would like to um, crown themselves emperor of, of Europe. If you are here, get prayer at the end, it's really important. Um, but for most of us, it's, it's not really how it manifests because we don't, well, we're not emperors, but also that things happen in different hierarchies of our life and, and it can come, come out in smaller decisions and smaller aspects of how we live our lives. And so it can come, come out as um, insecurity, as, petty, as pettiness, as kind of this toxic competitiveness. Um, we can sometimes lead into hypocrisy because the impression we give out matters more than how we actually are. Um, it can make us latch onto people or projects that we deem to be significant so that by association we can somehow scrape some of that significance onto ourselves. We name drop, we people drop. And on a more deeper fundamental level, we can start to have this profound fear of being forgotten and overlooked by the people around us, by our community, by history itself. Do you fear being forgotten? I do. And that can happen as much inside the church as well as outside the church. And so this is profoundly, I think, universal as a human experience. And by the way, uh, these are all problems that I never struggle with. I'm just I'm talking to you now as someone who's got it all figured out, absolutely. And underlying um, this, this thing, this vainglory, is a profound lie that has snuck into our psyche. And this profound lie is this, that significance equals recognition, earthly recognition. And this is a lie that is really hard to break apart. Michael Collins did incredible things, yet for us, somehow his lack of recognition cheapens or lessens the significance that we feel he has in culture and in history and in society. But this is the lie that Jesus never, ever falls into in his life. And so I think we really see that playing out in our passages today.
So if you have Mark 1 open, do turn to it with me. I'll kind of be spending some time in it. Now, Mark 1 is a, uh, a breathless chapter. We, we come straight into the action with Jesus healing, and he's baptized, and he's in the desert, and he comes out of the desert, and he is bursting onto the scene like nothing else. His fame is like wildfire. He, he is this charismatic rabbi who is healing and casting out demons and doing amazing things, and he is on this ascent to fame. And we read just before this passage that the people were amazed at what he was doing, and that, his, that news about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Word of mouth marketing, still the best marketing tool we have to this day. And our passage continues his ascent to fame. Uh, we read that Jesus is at synagogue, and just after synagogue, he goes to Simon and Pete, Simon and Andrew's house, where his mother-in-law is, Simon's mother-in-law is sick, and Jesus heals her of her fever, and she gets up and begins to wait on Jesus and his disciples. And what happens next seems to be that this news of this healing gets around this town of Capernaum, and then the entire town bring all their sick, all their possessed, all those who need healing to this small house where Jesus is staying. There's a lot of hype. There is a lot of things going on right now, and he receives them all, and begins to heal them, which I imagine generates even more hype in this place, his ascent to fame. And the question then is, how does Jesus respond to this kind of recognition and this kind of significance that's being conferred onto him by his community? Well, the first thing I'm struck by, one thing, is that Jesus continues to see the one. I'm struck by the fact um, that even in the text itself, it, it bothers to mention the specificity of Simon's mother-in-law who had a fever to be healed. And what this tells us is that for Jesus, even in his ascent to fl- his fame, saw the specifics of the one person who needed healing. Now, it can be a temptation sometimes when we... Um, when our sphere of influence grows, when we get promoted, when we have more people to kind of delegate to and, and get senior, to kind of have this entitlement that we stand above the minutiae, that, 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 that somehow smaller work is unworthy of our station. Uh, I've seen this in, in my workplace in, in the past, and um, that is not the way of Jesus. That just isn't the way Jesus runs things. Because Jesus, no matter how influential and big he gets, always has time for the one. I'm really, uh, there was, I know this woman in, in, in London, she's the most impressive person you'll ever meet in your entire life. One of those people who's like, how, you have like 80 hours in a day, don't you? She's CEO of many different things, she's in the House of Lords, and she's done things that has honestly made a difference to millions of people in this nation uh, for incredible things. And she's, yeah, a real hero of mine. And, um, but the one thing that really impresses me about her most of all is the fact that Despite her 80-hour days and despite her significance and influence, she always takes time to look out for the homeless community in literally her neighborhood around her. That's amazing. No matter how senior or how influential or how impressive you get, never forget the one. That is the way of Jesus. Because there are people in this room who are going to be very significant or who already are, (laughs) have a very wide influential sphere don't, don't forget the one. But the main thing I see Jesus doing when he's confronted with recognition is that he seems to aggressively push away the spotlight. He aggressively pushes away any sense of earthly significance and fame, and he aggressively almost tries to contain the news about him spreading too quickly or too fast. And that's really interesting. You know, we, we get these small clues in the, in the text too, because um, in verse 29 we have, as soon as they left the synagogue, Jesus and his disciples went to Simon and Andrew's house. As soon as, which, is, which means that he didn't stick around to kind of bask in the glory of his healing. He, he, he hid immediately to Simon and Andrew's house. And then in the second half of our passage, we have this remarkable detail into Jesus' inner life where it says, very early in the morning, 
While it was still dark, Jesus went off to a solitary place, a lonely place to pray, and he hides. Simon and his, and his disciples are like, where have you gone? They go to look for him, and they say to him, everyone's looking for you, Jesus. Come and do more of your magic tricks. Come on, do more stuff. And then Jesus, in that moment, says something actually, quite frankly, amazing, stunning, in fact. He says, let us go somewhere else. Let's go somewhere else to smaller villages around, and I can preach there, and I can do some healing there. That's remarkable. Now, in a previous life, I was, um, I was in advertising, which means you can trust me. Um, and, and if Jesus was a client of mine, I, I, this is not what I would recommend to any, any sane clients. No, what you do when you have a growing new audience is, 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 is you, you don't ditch them, for one. What you want to do is you want to consolidate your audience. You want to test and learn some good content of what works for them, like reaction videos maybe, you know, I don't know. And then you want to start giving them more of what they want. And then you want to start to aggressively push them down the conversion funnel to get them to pay for stuff or get their loyalty or their brand affinity or whatever. That's kind of what you do. That's how you build a brand. That's how you build a movement. That's how you build, dare I say, a religion, actually. But that isn't what Jesus does. At the height of his significance, he, 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 he runs away. He hides. And the question that I have for everyone here is, um, why? Why does Jesus do this? Because this isn't a one-off. This is a pattern we see over and over again in Jesus' life. He, he, every time there's a crowd, or every time something big happens that almost glorifies him on earth, Jesus seems to run in the opposite direction into the desert. He's, he'll say a hard teaching to disperse the crowds. It's really interesting. We have to think about why he does this. Uh, and you know, one you know, easy answer is, oh, he was a big introvert. You know, I get that. I, I want to leave church sometimes immediately afterwards because people are scary. Um, but I think that perhaps is a more profound, deeper reason to why Jesus has this pattern in his life. Um, in Hebrews 3, it talks about how Jesus Christ, though he was God, though he was sinless, was tempted in every way just as we are. He was tempted in the desert as well, but also it's in his life. And so perhaps one of the reasons Jesus continually has this practice of hiding away, leaving, is because he himself was aware of the temptation of vainglory, of earthly significance, of, of, of the adoring eyes and of, and, of, and of glory. And so what, what does that mean for us? Well, if the Son of God himself was aware of the dangers of the crowd and of eyeballs, how much more should we be wary of it, right? When early Christian writers and mystics reflected on this pattern of um, Jesus' public ministry and his hiding away to his um, intimate places, uh, they began to talk about the, the practice of hiddenness, the Christian practice of hidden, hiddenness, which they said was the cure and the remedy to this uh, addiction and obsession and this slavery for earthly desire and significance. It's tyrannical, this desire. It consumes us. And so this practice of hiddenness um, then manifests in two different kinds of ways. And the first way it manifests is in this practice of voluntary hiddenness. And that's kind of what we get in Matthew 6. Um, we have these uh, really great lines about when you pray, don't do it in public, do it in secret. When you fast, don't let anybody know that you're fasting. And when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Yes, left hand or your right hand is doing. Uh, just don't let anyone know. Make sure nobody knows about the good and impressive things that you do. In fact, go out of your way to not let people know about those things. And this is a really, really simple, in principle, practice but it's really hard. Like, did it even happen if it's not in your stories? I don't think so. 
So if you volunteered at a charity or have given to a charity, just, don't, just keep it to yourself. Or if you've got a first in your degree, who needs to know? Probably no one. Um, if you get promoted at work, and we've seen these, haven't we, on LinkedIn. Don't, don't write, I'm so delighted to share that I've become senior account managing director of whatever company. I don't care, for one. But secondly, what, why? What's it feeding inside of you? It, like maybe your friends and your family need to know, the people who got you there perhaps, but what is it feeding inside of you when, 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 when we're doing this? Ego, insecurity, instability. Voluntary hiddenness is starving yourself of human affirmation so that you can receive divine affirmation. Because once you crowd out the voices of the world, you can hear more clearly the voices of heaven. And Jesus himself says that when we practice hiddenness, um, then your Father in heaven who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And the reward we get is the smiling face of God. It's living out the truth that significance has nothing to do with recognition or visibility. And that's a really important practice. I really encourage you this week to, this month or this year, just to give it a go. Try practicing voluntary hiddenness. Don't tell anybody about the good things you do. At first, it's gonna feel a bit weird. It's gonna feel a bit, I don't know, almost, something dies inside of you when you do this occasionally. Um, but I promise you, the more you do it, the more you realize that actually you are being recognized, you are being seen, you are being approved of, but not by human eyes that hear one day and face tomorrow, but by the eyes of God himself. Voluntary hiddenness. The second manifestation of this practice of hiddenness is... Um, what I'm calling involuntary hiddenness. And to be honest, this kind of is where most of us find, find ourselves most of the time for most of our life. It's this thing of being unrecognized for all the good things you do involuntarily. So parenting is the best example of this because no one's gonna see those late nights, no one's gonna see those diapers and that mess that's happening in front of you, yes, a, a nuclear bomb, of all terrible things going on. Um, and yet it is the most significant vocation of our of humanity that's been neglected by our culture for so long. Amen. Parenting, oh man, yeah. Uh, most admin jobs are like this, project management, ops, any people like that in this room. You know, you do all the things in secret, in the background, while disorganized, visionary, top-line people get all the credit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I see nods there. And most creatives I know live in this space for pretty much their entire careers. Um, you know, Creatives, you give your blood, sweat, and tears to something, you, you, you edit, you film, you color grade, you record, and you mix, and you spend hours mastering something, and, um, and you put yourself out there on YouTube or Spotify or whatever platform of your choice, and what happens? You get 2,000 views, and it gets swept away by the algorithm, and gets replaced by a reaction video to, I don't know, something ridiculous. It's, it's acid to the soul. It's awful. I mean, I, I, I do some photography on the side, and do you, do you know how much it hurts? Um, <laughs> uh, how much it hurts knowing that a reposted meme gets more engagement than this photo I've spent hours editing and selecting and, and having the 10 years of you know, visual culture that I've been consuming? Oh, don't get me... Sorry, this is... A <laughs> Involuntary hiddenness. And we can do one of two things. We can resent it, hate it, and, and, and sort of engineer and start to chase recognition, which turns us, turns us into small-minded, selfish people. So not good. Or we can receive these seasons, or even a lifetime, of involuntary hiddenness as a gift from God himself. Because Jesus says that the Father sees what is done in secret, and he rewards that. And he says that those who are recognized on earth have already received their reward. So in some ways, the only way to store up treasures in heaven is, is to do things in secret. And if your whole life is secret, then you are storing up glorious things for yourself 
in heaven. So, so we can receive involuntary hiddenness as a gift from God that does the same thing in our hearts um, as hiddenness, which is to separate out significance and recognition as different things altogether. So that's the practice of hiddenness, the remedy for the slavery and oppression of worldly significance. Hiddenness then breaks that psychological relationship between significance and, and recognition. It, it kind of frees us um, in many ways to, to value God's affirmation more than our own, than human affirmation. And it also, I suppose, helps us to kill our own desire to to build our own name so that we can build up his name on earth. And the fruit of this, the fruit of hiddenness, is the Christian virtue of humility, true humility. And what is humility? I suppose humility is the the inner peace and stability of knowing who you are in the eyes of God. I think that's probably the core of humility. So what? It's a classic marketing thing. So what? So what? So what? Christian humility. Well, firstly, there are a huge amount of internal benefits. So, so when we begin to cultivate this, we become free. Like for freedom, Christ set us free. And this is one of the greatest freedoms we can have. We can be free from these pangs of jealousy and insecurity when other people are praised. We can be free from these delusional senses of self-importance. We can be free um, to just do our creative things without this angst of thinking, who's gonna see this? Or, or you know, what if this doesn't make, it? doesn't make it? And we can be free to just actually even receive compliments and praise as just beautiful gifts given rather than this drug that temporarily numbs our own insecurity. We we can become free. But actually, the real benefit of Christian humility actually is external, in fact. It's not primarily internal, because when we are free from chasing earthly significance, what we can start to do is we can begin to start to step into and receive the heavenly significance that God has for you and for me, because it means that we can start to um, pursue the things that God actually finds valuable. And what God finds valuable are the things that will actually have eternal consequences. And, and the highest of these things, of course, is love. Really, true love. And, and, and when we have humility, we, we can begin to love properly, love our neighbor, love our enemy, and love our God with a free, pure kind of love. We can be free to give God all the glory and recognition that he deserves. We can be free to generously give out compliments and praise and credit without falling into some like zero-sum fame game at work. That's really disgusting, I think. We can be free to pursue our creative passions without any kind of sense of um, less thanness. We can be free to take responsibility of our spheres of influence, big or small, without this desire for more and more and more, which actually makes our role in that place worse because we aren't doing things for the greater good of that sphere. We're trying to build our own thing. And we can be free, even in a small scale, to to go to a party and talk to the shy person in the corner as opposed to look around the room to find someone more important to talk to, to scrape off glory. The thing is, the places that need the most love and healing in the world are most likely going to be in the hidden, secret places of, of our culture. And so Christians, you know, we, we need to be a people who, who understand our infinite significance and who are incredibly comfortable with obscurity and hiddenness. Hidden acts of great love. That, that's, I think, what Jesus calls us to in, in most of our lives in, in terms of our, what we're here to do. And why is this? Because actually, this is how God demonstrated his love to us. 
Actually, his love to us was this kind of hidden, humble love. You know, Jesus, he was the only human being ever to exist. He, d- he didn't find himself thrown into the world. He knew exactly who he was. He, he had a mission and a purpose and a particular thing he came to do. He wasn't grasping at meaning. He knew why he was there. He was the son of God. He was sent from heaven to earth, not thrown He is the wisdom of God. He is the word of God who became incarnate, as that video said, incarnate on planet Earth. But he did not consider this equality with God something to exploit or to build up his own name. Instead, he humbled himself continually to the lowest place. Lower and lower he went always. You know, we have Christmas coming around very soon. And um, what is Christmas about, really? Jesus is the right answer, Uh, not Mariah Carey. (laughs) Um, But Christmas is about how the infinite became an infant and then was hidden in a manger in Nazareth. Um, and, and, And sort of God chose to break into the world, not in a blaze of glory, but born as a peasant baby, hidden. And when this baby grew up, he... When he did become a rabbi who drew crowds with his healings and his teachings, what did he do? He he would run away from the crowds and hide himself to pray to his father in heaven. And who did he pray for? Probably for us. He prayed for us when he used to hide and pray. And when the time was right, what happened? He continued to humble himself, to go lower and lower and lower. Even death on the cross down into the grave. And this really is where the ultimate paradox happens between significance and hiddenness. Because the most significant moment of human history, the most significant moment in my life and in your life and in the life of everyone to have ever lived happened in total obscurity. You know, who saw Jesus die on the cross? Far outside the city walls, a few drunk soldiers, a group of weeping women, mocking passerbys, two condemned criminals, and one disciple. It's like, what, 20 people, 30 people? We have about 200 in this room. More, more people are here, <laughs> 10 times more people are here than they were at the crucifixion of Jesus. That's remarkable, that the moment that liberated all of humanity, that opened up the gates of heaven, that just gave us freedom and forgiveness and, and healing, all this happened in total obscurity. And what that tells us is that God's lavish love for us is, is demonstrated to us in such beautiful and humble ways. A God who loves his children more than he loves his majesty or his or his fame even. And it was the humility of Jesus, the humility of his death, that made him worthy to be recognized by heaven. Because it was because he went down to the grave, he is now exalted far above the heavens. And it's because he died on the cross, humiliated and and hidden. That's the reason why he is now honored and crowned and and, and glorified and praised by angels and archangels and by two billion people around the world because of his love and his humble love for us. It's like in that, that hymn, Here is Love. It says, who his love will not remember, who can cease to sing his praise, he will never be forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days. And you and I can be found in Christ, in that love, which means that we can share in his glory. We can share in his um, significance eternally. Your your life and my life can matter for all of eternity. History is just a dust. It's a a breath. It's gone. But eternity is forever. And, And you and I can be remembered in Christ forever. So, So why waste our time on things that will fade, where moth and rust will destroy. And the question really is, I ask myself even, is is it enough for you if only God knows? Is it enough? I 
I want to end with um, one final really practical um, thing for you all. Uh, maybe you can tell that this is quite a personal area for me, um, this tension. Um, but about five or six years ago, I, I discovered a prayer written about a few hundred years ago, and it's so beautiful. It's called the Litany of Humility. And I, and, I, and I found it to be the most helpful and challenging prayers to pray. And I tried to pray it quite regularly. I used to pray it like every single day for about two years, and now it's just a more regular practice I have. And, and so if you are here and you, and you struggle with this tyranny of earthly recognition and visibility and this chasing, this prayer can be a key that unlocks um, just freedom for you as you journey on. I want to pray an abridged version because it's quite long. You can find the full version on Google. But um, should we all pray together as I lead us? Here it is. Lord Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. From the desire of being esteemed, from the desire of being loved, from the desire of being consulted, from the desire of being honored, deliver me, Jesus from the fear of being humiliated, from the fear of being ridiculed, from the fear of being forgotten, from the fear of being suspected, deliver me, Jesus. That others may be esteemed more than I, that others may increase and I may decrease, that others may be chosen and I set aside, that others may be praised and I unnoticed. Grant me the grace desire it. In Jesus' name, amen.